OK, uh, so uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Matej Hoffman from Czech Technical University in Prague, who is a well-known researcher uh, focusing on robotics. Uh, he's the one who has a rich uh, experience with working abroad and also, also international cooperation. And uh, probably he will soon be the first one to have an ICAP a humanoid robot in Prague uh, uh, within the Central Europe, if I'm correct. So uh, Matej will talk about his primary uh, topic of research, learning body mo models from humans to humanoid robots. Uh, if you have some questions later on, uh, feel free to ask or by raising your hand, uh, but we will have discussion after his presentation. Uh, so, Mate, I'm glad you are here <laughs> online and uh, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Igor. Good afternoon, everybody. So, let's uh, get started. Um, so, I'll just briefly introduce my group. So, we are here in, uh, located in, in Prague and uh, it's a group focusing on humanoid cognitive developmental and collaborative robotics and this is our team at the moment so there is one postdoc there are five phd students and uh, there are two master students who have been working with us for some time and so the lab is the people and also the robots so these are the the, the robots we have and currently our icap is in production and it will be delivered at the latest in June. So we are we, we are eagerly waiting to receive our, our ICAP. Uh, we have this now also, the now with which we had covered with the with the with the ICAP scheme, because we, we specialize basically on robots with skin. So we have also the you know only now in the world that has whole body sensitive skin also on its face. And uh, we have also industrial robots with skin, like this air skin. We have some manipulators, some grippers. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's, that's the equipment that we use. But for, uh, mostly, you know, humanoid robots are kind of our our focus. Um, so this slide, I I like to use, which kind of uh, I think nicely expresses the the core of my of, of my research. So you see there a baby that is being tested with some vibrating. Uh, uh, elements we call it buzzers so it's it's a it's a little thing that vibrates like thing like a, when you have your cell phone on vibration mode and we've we've been testing in collaboration with uh, psychologists with uh, jeff lockman in new orleans and with kevin o'regan and uh, with the baby lab in paris many many kids like hundreds of kids at different ages with these experiments and we basically want to see how they how the how the baby builds the model of its body. So in this kind of functional sensory motor sense, you know, if you put the buzzer there, it means it needs to localize and it also needs to reach. So it's a sort of functional test of body knowledge. And here you see the ICAP robot, which is doing, doing somehow the same thing. We tickle it on the forearm and then it loops there, then it reaches there. And so we have quite a nice match in terms of behavior and also in terms of the sensory motor level, because importantly, the ICAP also has this whole body skin. So there is touch, there is proprioception, there is binocular vision. And uh, on one hand, so the baby obviously learns the, the body model somehow almost from scratch. I mean, of, of course, there are some genetic predispositions, but uh, but uh, the from what we are seeing, it really seems that it, the key is learned in this first, let's say, half a year of life. So if the robot could do something like that, you know, learn the model of its body from scratch, that would be very cool. That would be uh, very useful. So that's one, one motivation. And the other motivation is that we don't understand what, what the baby brain is doing such that it can learn uh, the, the, to, to succeed in this task. So we, so we would like to understand this with the help of the, of the humanoid robot. So it's an embodied computational model. Um, so this is just another way of explaining the methodology. So we're somehow in the middle. We call these synthetic sciences, artificial intelligence, or robotics. We have some neural networks and we have some hardware. So we have the robots. And then on one hand, we collaborate with empirical science, with uh, 
a bit neuroscience, a bit psychology, like for example, these buzzer experiments. So we model them using robots. So this is this understanding by building or synthetic modeling. And then we come back to our collaborators with, you know, possible explanations, mechanisms, hypotheses, suggestions for new experiments. So that's one side of the thing. And the other side is turning these things that we, that, that we learn when, let's say, taking inspiration from babies or animals, turning them into useful applications. So first prototypes and eventually applications in service robotics, collaborative robotics, self-calibration. Um, so there's body maps in the brain. I guess most of you have seen the, the homunculus-like representations. There's, of course, much more than that. Some people, so psychologists have been working on this for, for a century now, and they have invented a lot of concepts like body schema, like body image, like body structure description, body semantics, hierarchies of these representations. But still, there's quite little convergence, and the mechanisms are largely unknown. So there is some kind of chaotic state of affairs there. What we focus on are body representations that mediate implicit knowledge related to the body, its parts, and their posture in the context of sensory motor coordination. So it's basically the lowest level. So we don't research body semantics. We mostly research the what you can also call the sensory motor self. Uh, okay, here you just see on the, the, the first video, the, the one on the right you have seen before, this is the same task, but it's the same baby to two months earlier. And it seems that it sort of feels the stimulus, but it wouldn't know how to react. Whereas what you see on the right, it's really a highly coordinated reaction where both arms are active and there's looking. So it's a, it, it, it's really a lot that has been learned in those two months. And uh, that's something that uh, that we want to understand. And, uh, and we have collected a, a lot of data. And now basically the challenge is to, to really uh, develop a model that would, uh, that would uh, uh, comply with this uh, data. Uh, so, so there's this is just a, a couple of papers. So there's a, there's cross-sectional studies, there's longitudinal studies, and more than a hundred babies have been tested by now, the with different locations on the on on the body and the face. This, the results basically always tell the same story that as the baby grows older, the success rate in this buzzer task goes up but it's different for the different body locations so some body locations like the mouth are there from the from very early on like from three months and some are very difficult so for example the elbow is the most difficult location because it's it, it's really far and you sort of need it to uh, the the other arm to help for you to uh, reach for the buzzer so that's kind of you know how this is somehow filling up with experience we have also now a running study with uh, visually impaired uh, kids because it would be interesting also to see, you know, when you don't have vision, you know, whether you know whether you can perform. So the task itself does not require vision, you know, with, with somatosensory uh, information you can do it, but you might not do it as well, or you might develop different representations when you don't have vision. So that's basically what we want to see also from the from the study in the visually impaired uh, kids. So one thing is that, that there is you know success or there is no success, and the another thing is how that success happens. So basically, how the reaching uh, is performed. So we started to looking into that because I'm more and more starting to think that it's not that there is a map, you know, that you just fill in the location and then you can do it. It's it's more something like that, you know. It's a dynamic process how that reaching happens, and it the baby may not actually know how it's eventually going to reach. Maybe it's constructed on the run, so maybe the perspective that there is a map, it's just not correct. So, uh, so we're also looking into how this reaching happens. So there's a couple of things that you can look at. For example, the limp with the buzzer. You know, is it also helping to be? For the buzzer to be retrieved and is it you know moving is it rotating or is it translating if it's the elbow for example it would help if you rotate 
so these kind of things. Also, do the let's say if it's on the link, do the arms move simultaneously, like what you saw before, that they move uh, simultaneously, or is it like that? You know, the one with the buzzer is still, and the other reaches. It seems that as the baby grows older, there's more and more of this simultaneous movement. And then there's also the looking. So and again, is it like first look and then reach, or is it simultaneous? So all these things are important for us to to build the uh, the right model and to understand uh, what is going on. Uh, and one more thing that we studied. So this is a baby that was followed for for one year. And uh, here you see snapshots of successful reaches for the buzzer on the on the forehead. And what we want to see here is we want to see the variability in the arm configuration or in the posture in uh, when the baby is uh, is reaching. So because that is important, you know, for how we should build the model. So how how the kinematic redundancy uh, is uh, is handled. So basically, is it you know always the same? Is it dependent on the posture or on the age or on the context? It seems, at least from what we see here, that the postures are are very similar. So so although there is like one year of age uh, from the beginning to the end, it seems that it's using uh, the very similar arm configuration to reach, which is something that we can incorporate into the models that we are. Uh, that we are building. So that was the empirical data. And now, if you want to build a model, you need to somehow conceptualize it. Uh, this one is by Matthew Longo and uh, and colleagues. And so it deals with spatial localization of touch. Um, so to localize a stimulus, a tactile stimulus so on your skin in space, you need you need to, you need more more than let's say the localization on the skin itself because if you want to localize it on space you also need to know where that body part is in space so so one thing is this tactile reference and superficial schema that you can sort of view as this tactile homunculus but that would only sort of give you somatic localization so where it is on the skin let's say on the homunculus but to localize where it is in space you need to know where your your, uh, your hand, for example, or arm, or whichever part of the body is in space, for which you need proprioceptive afferents. There, that flows into the posture schema. But that's not enough. But you also need some kind of model of body size and shape. So basically, you need to know how your for, how long your forearm is, and then if you have the joint angle here and here, and you have also the body proportions, then you can basically map which in robotics is something we call forward kinematics. So you basically need to map from the joint angle space to the uh, to Cartesian space, you know, where the end effector or any part of the body or skin is in space. So putting all this together allows you to localize touch in space. And so that's one part of the story. That's one component. And then for you to reach you basically need to turn this localization into a reaching target. Then you need some movement preparation and motor control such that you can eventually succeed in the task. So this is a sort of conceptualization of uh, of what is needed for you to succeed uh, in this task. Now, of course, uh, the brain somehow somehow does that, and this is one uh, uh, one possibility how the how the circuitry in the brain that is responsible for this might look like. So this anterior parietal cortex is with these homuncular-like representations. This area 3B and 1, they specialize on uh, on touch mostly. The 3A is more proprioception, then it starts to be mixed. But here the somatotopia is very clear. So the colors here mean, mean that, for example, the, the, the legs of the monkey are in this area, the hand is in this blue area, the face is the, the green areas. So there you would get the activations of where it is on the skin and also, let's say, the joint angle, so the proprioception. And then in posterior parietal cortex, somehow things are being put together and eventually you get something like the body in space. 
and uh, that's not really well understood and that's also sort of the challenge for for our for our modeling and eventually when you localize in space you can then turn it into the reaching target which is something that posterior parietal cortex is also partly a motor area and then eventually it would bring about that uh, reaching movement so this kind of circuit is something that we want to model and uh, and develop in our in our in our robot um, so you've seen this video before so we have a robot that is already doing this but uh, the way it is doing is not like the brain does it so this has this model has been engineered so we have the activations on the skin we also have calibration of the skin in space so we can get coordinates of uh, of the activation in some kind of local frame you know so where this part of the skin is with respect to the wrist let's say and then we have this forward kinematics we have joint angles we have the robot model we can easily get any part of the robot in space and if we put this together we can basically localize the uh, the activated part of the skin in 3d space we can make it a reaching target and we can just send the other arm to that place okay so so the robot is already doing that but uh, it's unlikely that the brain would be using the same it's still striking that there's the similarity with the longo schematics is quite high and that's maybe because that schematics is in a way sort of classical and probably it, what happens in reality is something more let's say sensory motor and recurrent and that because this pipeline basically just goes from left to right and this is likely not what is happening in the brain so that's basically the uh, the challenge that we want to that we want to address uh, so we can basically go step by step so we start from the longer schematics so one thing one component that we need is the the superficial schema and that uh, uh, that was yeah that was accomplished on the on the ICAP, which I will show you in a second. This is again the the homunculus. This is the Penfield homunculus. This is more recent data with this area three B, which is the primary tactile area, which is located here. And since we have this robot with this whole body skin, we wanted to have uh, something like that for the robot. Now the homunculus is uh, lateralized, so that means there's only one half of the body in one hemisphere. And so we took just a subset for the ICAP for the moment, because ICAP doesn't have uh, skin on the face, and we were not interested in the legs for the moment. So we basically just took a subset of this map, which corresponds to the uh, right hand and to the torso, so which you, what you see here. And then we took a standard uh, self-organizing map and we designed basically the output layer which would which, which would have which has these dimensions such that it somehow matches the you know, you know what we expect uh, here so it, we, we want to have basically like a stripe that is somewhat similar to the homunculus and the input layer you see those more than 1000 taxels on this uh, on these body parts so the, so uh, igor was the uh, co-author on on this work so what you see here on the left is basically the stimulation. So I was going around the eye cup with my thumb for maybe half an hour. And since my since my thumb is bigger than a single uh, tactile sensor, so this these are the these are how the sensors look like. And uh, so with one sensor is one circle, and my thumb covers almost the whole triangle. So on average, maybe seven taxels at a time. And from this information, because they were concurrently activated, the algorithm can learn that they belong together. So that's the that's the, the principle uh, how the self-organizing map learns the uh, the topology. Um, and uh, okay, sorry about the video. And what you see on the right is already the end product. So after learning, you see activations on that uh, ICAP homunculus, if you want. And we can now look into how, how that was constructed. If you use this Cohonen map without any additional constraints, then every time you run it on the data, it will end up with a different arrangement of the of the of the skin parts on the output map. So for example, here or here, sometimes some body parts can also you know, be split 
because there's not enough constraints. There are many ways how you can basically put skin in 3D into a 2D map. But since we wanted to have something that is like in the brain, because it can actually matter the, uh, the arrangement, we sort of emulated the genetic predispositions because each of you basically has the same gross layout on, of, this, of this map because it's genetically predetermined. So we modified the SOM algorithm with some what we called maximum receptive field SOM. So we constrained the receptive fields from which uh, uh, each of these parts of the output map can take their inputs. So that means the torso part, what is supposed to be the torso part, is not listening to the whole body, but instead it's only taking the torso and let's say part of the upper arm. So that's been predetermined. And then the rest is basically learned from the from experience, so from the concurrent uh, stimulations uh, that you, you've, you've, you've seen before. And yeah, eventually you get something like this, which is which is basically something that we that we wanted. So you have the the growth layout like in the like in the like in the monkey brain, and you have the details learned from the from the experience. And here are some details. So these are the receptive fields of individual neurons uh, of the torso. So that's the part here. So that means the neuron here learned to specialize on you know, this part of the torso. This neuron learned to specialize on this part of the torso. And you see that the, the topology preservation there, that the neighboring neurons in the output map represent uh, uh, adjacent areas in the, on the input. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so I think that for, for this part, uh, this was quite a relatively straightforward task, and so we have we have that we have that ready. So the next target is the proprioceptive afferents and the postural schema. So let's uh, let's move to that, uh, and that turns out to be to be more difficult. Uh, First, because proprioception is not really one modality, but because it's composed of multiple modalities. So there are these muscle spindles that measure muscle length and speed. There are also the Golgi organs that measure force. There are also other, other receptors. However, to simplify the situation, we sort of you know, took the assumption that the muscle spindles are the principal uh, proprioceptors. The length of a muscle still doesn't give you the, the joint angle, and uh, so you, you need some kind of trigonometric relation of this sort. But the muscle spindles, the individual muscle spindles, have also you know different different lengths. So it's not clear how this is done and where this is done. It seems for us, you know, let's say from the mathematical or from the robotics perspective, the joint angle is something very useful. But it's not clear how the uh, peripheral or central new, uh, neural system would actually arrive to, to, to how it would learn to represent joint angles. It may it may actually not explicitly sort of represent them. So that's one one complication for us. Um, this study looked in detail into uh, with monkey electrophysiology how <laughs> how uh, proprioception is encoded at least for the uh, for the hands of the monkey. And what they found is that so different neurons represent different things. Some are what they call position scaled. So the new the neuron firing rate is proportional to the to the angle of a joint. Some of them are the same but multi-digit. But some are posture selective. So that means the, the peak of a tuning curve of the neuron would correspond to a particular posture of let's say one or multiple fingers. So it's it's a different sort of representation. So and and all of these are there, and this of course you know it's not clear how to proceed from a, from a, from a robotics uh, uh, perspective. So we made two attempts here. One was that we used the, and in both cases we used the SOM. In one case we basically had the high cup babble, let's say, and doing hand regard, which is a behavior that also infants do that they sort of observe their hand in front of their face and we recorded the joint angles and then we 
we had a song basically learned uh, so, so the receptive field of every neuron would then be the the joint configuration of the whole arm okay so this is something corresponding to that posture selective that you saw before in this case it would be selective to the posture of the of the whole uh, arm chain and here is another study where we adapted this uh, uh, maximum receptive field SOM to, to proprioception, where we basically, inspired by what we see in the brain, we basically constrained that each neuron should see only one or two joint angles and not the complete arm, which uh, which which is probably you know more meaningful because seven degrees of freedom, let's say here for the arm to fit it into a 2D output sheet is uh, is going to result in a lot of a lot of discontinuities and a lot of uh, a lot of distortions. So we have also this, but still I consider these results preliminary. And it's uh, it's striking how little is known about how proprioception is actually represented in the brain. So we need to do uh, more work there. And eventually, so imagine that we have this homunculus for the skin and some kind kind of representation for the uh, for the proprioception. This should be combined together, which is presumably happening in the posterior parietal cortex, and then eventually, you know, creating the motor output. So this, that's this kind of minimal uh, double touch producing circuit that you're looking for. And uh, this is, you know, one possible way of how a minimalistic way of how this could per perhaps be connected together. So this would be this homunculus. This would be the, the map representing the individual joints so the proprioceptive map. And then there would be some, some population of neurons that would, be, that would be putting these together. And a similar architecture uh, to this is something that we have now worked in progress uh, thanks to uh, Igor and his uh, his students. So, so uh, I'm I'm really looking forward to uh, to add this uh, piece of uh, puzzle uh, to this um, story. Now, so there is the hypothesis is that. Uh, Self-contact experience can allow you to, to learn about your body in space. So, of course, we cannot exclude vision and it probably plays a part, but this is going to make things even more complicated. But, you know, for the sort of, for us, the, the, the radical hypothesis now is that we can do it without vision. And obviously the blind kids uh, can do it. So, so we first focus on basically models that, that use only somatosensory and motor uh, modalities. Uh, there is this self-contact experience already in the fetus and then also after birth. So we have also we also collaborating with Daniela Corbetta and they, they do these uh, studies in um, uh, babies, uh, basically newborn, so I mean the first two months of life. And there is a lot of spontaneous self-touch happening. So and this is possibly the sort of the uh, the learning material from which they can extract uh, uh, how their body in space uh, uh, looks like. So first, there will be spontaneous self-touch. Then this, this motor proprioceptive tactile, possibly also visual correlations would be detected and cataloged. And uh, the question is whether that is that is all. So whether you know spontaneous behaviors like this would be enough because this is not very efficient, right? Because most of the times the most of the time the limbs would be in space without uh, generating any contact. So the the question is whether there's a whole field. Uh, it's called intrinsic motivation or artificial curiosity, or it has different names. Basically, the idea is that the that learning is is something that is learning about interaction with the world or the body is something that is interesting and uh, it can drive the exploration, it can focus the exploration. So for example, rather than moving the limb in space, let's say touching your face is more inter interesting because it gives rise to multimodal stimulation and uh, it may be an interesting event that the brain may sort of favor. And uh, 
it may repeat it at higher frequency, thereby creating basically more learning material. So that uh, so that would be this kind of intrinsic motivation story. So what you see here is the baby exploring uh, her face, and of course from the video it's it's really hard to see whether you know that is spontaneous or or whether it's focused or intrinsically motivated. But if you get statistics, you can at least get some idea. Uh, so this is basically another study that we are uh, the, the, that, that we're concluding now where we had a now robot with this also with this artificial skin in a simulator. The action space was the degrees of freedom of the arm and uh, possibly also the neck and the observation space in this case was the skin space with some projection. And uh, we applied the, the well-known methods from this, uh, from this intrinsic motivation community with the goal being, so it's, it's often applied for robots to learn to reach in 3D space. But in this case, we wanted to learn to touch the skin, so which is this, this 2D space, which is a little different task and also more difficult because when you don't touch the skin, you don't have any information, you don't have any feedback. So that basically, you know, it's it's a little twist of the of the problem. And uh, this is just to see, of course, if you do random motor babbling, most of the time you don't touch the skin, and you know, thereby you're not learning much. Uh, one efficient method from the uh, from the from this community, it's, it's, it comes from Perlix Udeas team. Uh, uh, they have a uh, library called Exploto. It's called discretized goal babbling. So, which means you're exploring the goal space, the skin space, and that's much more efficient than you know being sort of in the motor space because most of most points in the motor space are irrelevant because the hand is just in space. And so, you're building an inverse model from skin space to joint space. So, imagine you once accidentally touch the skin. Then you remember that posture and you try to look next in the skin space and at the same time you're building that inverse model. So so basically, yeah, so it's, it's much more efficient that you focus your exploration on the goal space. And in addition, you focus your exploration onto regions with fastest progress. So this discretized goal babbling means that you discretize the goal space, the skin into different regions and in those regions where you're currently making most progress in learning, uh, you focus your exploration uh, there. And if you then eventually test, so the testing here is that you, it's kind of the buzzer experiment. You ask you you ask the robot to reach for the different taxels, and then you measure the error in reaching. So the random motor babbling is, of course, uh, much less efficient than the other methods. And this is the number of touches. So the motor babbling, as we would expect, doesn't uh, doesn't give rise to touch very often, unlike the uh, again unlike the other methods that operate in the goal space and that uh, that monitor the uh, the learning uh, progress. Uh, okay, and now we move to the um, to the part uh, how we can make better robots uh, by having you know adaptive body schemas. So this is just some illustrations of what you know animals can do. So they can use tools, they can also learn to locomote even if they uh, if they miss some limbs. And these these are all things related to the to your body representation. So tool use is basically some kind of body extension. It's actually more than that because it's it's not just a stick, it's a it's a tool that you uh, that, that you're using in some particular way. Adaptation to injury, resilience. So all these things would be really nice to have in robots, but we are still quite far uh, from that. Um, if this video shows the awareness of body in space in an elephant, which is quite uh, quite remarkable. So it's, it's aware that it cannot pull that, uh, that thing when it's standing on it and it figures it out uh, really, really uh, quickly.
This is another example of polyschema adaptation. It's the so-called Pinocchio illusion. So if, if you hold your nose and then a bit, uh, the, then basically your uh, your tendons uh, in the biceps are vibrated. It gives you an illusion that your uh, that your arm is extending, but because you hold your nose, it also gives you the illusion that your nose is elongating, which is a a great example of the plasticity of the brain, and uh, this is something we would not expect our robots to feel. So if uh, if I make the eye cup touch its face and then basically you know to play with the encoder of its uh, of its elbow, with the models we currently have, it's never going to feel its nose elongating. So that's basically the uh, the, the challenge uh, for for us. Um, so the the models that robots currently have, at least the standard models they have, are very, very different than, than in the brain. So they are typically fixed, they are explicit, which here means, for example, so this is the forward kinematics. So, so you have the joint angles there, and you have the, the dimensions of the robot, and if you, with this simple trigonometry, you can map from the joint space and having the model there uh, into the uh, X, Y, Z, where the end effector is in space. So A3 in the model corresponds to the length of this link, and that's why we call it explicit. So there is this clear uh, correspondence. In this case, it's unimodal because it uses one sensory modality, the joint angles. And in the brain, we expect, expect something completely opposite. So we expect it, we, we know it's highly adaptive or plastic, as they call it in neuroscience. Implicit, because it would be quite hard to find a neuron that would represent, let's say, the length of your forearm in the brain. And it's known to be highly multisensory or multimodal. And now, so the goal of, uh, of, my, of my research is to bring the robot body models more in this direction for one reason being that we want to understand the mechanisms here that we don't understand currently. And second, because we expect this give, to give better performance of robots in terms of autonomy, robustness, and, uh, and safety. Uh, so as we saw, the, the robotic models tend to be fixed, centralized, explicit, minimal sensory information, and starting from significant prior knowledge. And calibration, is using typically some external metrology, which means you bring a highly precise and also uh, expensive laser tracker, for example. And uh, calibration is more like fine tuning of parameters of the model that has been given uh, a priori. So we, we, we wanted to move beyond that. So we made a series of studies where we basically have robots self-calibrate. This one was the, the first with Alessandro Roncone, where we basically used the skin on the robot to calibrate the kinematic model of the robot. So the idea here is, so you always, for you to learn anything, you always need redundant information. So for, for example, here, you need two sources of information about this point in space. One is the fingertip, and the other is the activation on the forearm skin. And because, you know they touch, you know that they are at the same location in 3D space. But when you do the, when you use the model of the robot, so when you do the forward kinematics for the left arm and for the right arm, you're likely to get a slight discrepancy. It's not going to end up in exactly the same point, and that gives you an error term that you can use for optimization. Uh, the representation, how robots, rep, robot kinematics is represented, it's using some, some convention, which is called denavid hartenberg it's convenient because rather than needing six parameters to know where your body is, uh, where you know, a, 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 let's say a link is in space, because you have three rotations and three translations, four are enough. So it's kind of parsimonious. So that's uh, that's good. You know, it's also the calibration is more efficient. But you know, if you had uh, six uh, DOF, it would also work. And. Uh, so you're optimizing a parameter vector that every link is, this, is expressed by these four parameters. In this case, we had 12 degrees of freedom because we had this, you know, this kind of joint chain comprising two arms. 
and uh, yeah, this is, we already explained that, right? So this one is going sort of to the skin and this is the finger that is touching the skin. And you, so you have this term that you're minimizing because you know they are at the same location in space. And you're looking for parameters, which is the body model that minimizes this, this error term, which is uh, fairly uh, straightforward. And uh, so once we had uh, the, uh, once we received our now with the skin, we were in the opposite sort of situation because for the ICAP, we already had calibration of the skin, but for, the, for our now, we didn't. So we kind of did the opposite. We used this self-contact to calibrate where the sensors are in space. So, so we use the forward kinematics and the self-contact to calibrate the positions of each of those uh, more than 1,000 sensors uh, in space. Uh, we compared different methods. So one was this self-contact. You have activations like this, which are rather big. So you need to localize somehow where is the centroid of that activation, which gives you additional errors. So it may not be the ideal method. So then we also mounted a finger on the robot to make it more accurate. So then you basically use the forward kinematics plus you calibrate the, the, the finger as a sort of tool. And then we also used the 3D reconstruction. So we basically took away the top part of the skin and we took uh, photos uh, from different angles and from there we locally reconstructed the, um, the positions of the taxels on every body part and uh, so in this paper we we explore basically how how good each individual method can be or how they can go together what is the the accuracy that you can that you can achieve with these different methods so it's it's a sort of practically motivated thing. You get a robot, you get, you know, skin, then somebody glues your skin on the robot and you have thousands of centers, you don't know where they are. So this is basically, these are different ways of how you can get those uh, coordinates. So spatial calibration of the, of the skin. And uh, this is work that combines, uh, so People have used self-observation, so robot looking at, at its hands, for example, and then calibrating using that information. Then we've been using this self-contact, and this work combines the two. So it basically closes several loops at once. There is self-contact, and there is what we call self-observation. And it turns out that the more information you have at the same time, there is a synergy. So basically the, yeah, the, the optimization is better and also what they call observability basic which is a control theoretic uh, basically method how you can define how identifiable the parameters are that also goes uh, goes up uh, but i will not go into the into the details uh, here this is just how the data set basically the properties of the data set uh, it was asked to reach so the self-contact was happening in front of the robot in this region. And these are the distributions that the joint angles had. In general, it's important that, you know, these are as close as possible to a uniform distribution. You basically want to sample the space of the joints from, from the biggest range you can have, because if you don't, then basically that, that, that joint would be hard to calibrate. Um, and uh, this is the Denavid Hartenberg representation of the arm. This is the chain going to the eye. This is the sub chain going to the other eye. And all the white parameters were calibrated. And now that you're combining more of these methods at the same time, you somehow need to bring them under one hood. So this is the error term for the self contact. And these are error terms for the what you see in the camera. So basically, you have, you know, you, you see something in the camera and at the same time you predict for using forward kinematics what you would see given the current model in the camera and that also gives you the error term. So, but these are all in, so this is the left camera and the left arm, right camera, etc. Uh, but these are in pixels and this is in millimeters, say. So you need an additional scale factor to sort of compensate for that and then you can combine all these, uh, all these together. 
uh, yeah, results. I think in the interest of time, I will I will skip that. Uh, the bottom line is that uh, the more chains you combine, uh, the the better the better results you get, and or you can also do with fewer poses. So that means your calibration will be quicker. And uh, then we also did, of course, if you combine these multiple chains, it also depends uh, the, the accuracy or the noise in the individual sensory modalities is also important. So we also did a study that compared, we basically emulated different levels of noise in the different uh, modalities, which, uh, which also, of course, impacts the, uh, the performance. Uh, yeah, that's something we can skip. And so this is another study. So bef so when I got uh, uh, to Prague, there was no humanoid, but I wanted to basically do experiments like this. But we find found this uh, huge uh, industrial manipulator, the dual arm in the cellar. So we turned it into a humanoid. We put basically two cameras here, and we made it do this self contact. It has these weird spheres with markers such that it can do this self-observation and it can also do self-contact. So we basically uh, did something similar also on this industrial setup to see how far we can go with these self-contained methods uh, on an industrial robot. So it's basically you know, calibrating an industrial robot using these kind of self-contained automatic uh, uh, ways. So this just gives you the, the, the big picture. So, so you can use self-contact to calibrate kinematics. You can use self-contactors and self-observation. Uh, you can also do the other way around. You can basically use uh, self-contact to calibrate skin. And you can basically apply all these also in an industrial robot. This one doesn't have skin, but it has four stock sensors. And so the this also gives you constraints because you know how the end effectors, how big they are, how big these spheres are, and you know that there is contact which you can measure. So this gives you also constraints that you can exploit uh, for calibration. And yeah, and we put together now a, a MATLAB uh, toolbox for this multi-robot, multi-chain calibration that uh, you are also free to uh, use. Okay, so so the self calibration uh, story is uh, is still you have a lot of information about the model and you're still just fine tuning the parameters. There is not much work in robotics, but there is some work where it where there is more of resilience. So these I think are the two most famous representatives. Uh, the robots are actually quite uh, quite similar. So they are some kind of star, uh, starfish, and so the idea is that the the, the robot has is, has different candidate models that it's trying to match with the experience or with with, with what it uh, uh, with, uh, with the sensory motor information from the world, and uh, and then the the, the the climax sort of of this approach is that they, they break off a leg of these robots and then it has to put together candidate models that fit this new situation and it can still adapt to uh, to these kind of new situations and that's something really what we would like to have but both of these works are still a sort of you know toy examples of this kind right it's not something that we can really uh, currently have with um, with any with any robots and also it's it's highly adaptive but it's still quite engineered so so it's not really something that how the brain would uh, how the brain would go about it and uh, so this is just a way of um, using the same axis that we saw before. So the standard robot model would be fixed. When you do this kind of self calibration, it's more adaptive. It's also more multi-sensorial or more multimodal. This is the robot of Josh Bogart, which would be much more adaptive. It's also using like three different sensory modalities. Uh, 
but still the brain is something that is really you know standing out it's it, it's much more uh, multimodal and it's also much much more uh, adaptive you can also look at body representations at different axes and uh, one of them is so centralized versus distributed so the brain you know we know that the representations in the brain would be distributed uh, however even if robot representations are centralized they are also often modular so that's a that's another property that you know you would have one module dealing with kinematics one dealing with dynamics one dealing with inverse kinematics and uh, that's of course convenient and uh, but there would be always just one module representing one thing. So in that sense, it would be universal, right? In the brain, it would be different, but still you would have, you obviously have areas that specialize on certain things. So it's not completely you know, distributed or specialized or uh, end to end. So he, here are examples of deep learning that basically you take a deep neural network, you connect it end to end from sensors to motors, and you teach it one task, and then it does it in this kind of completely specialized and end-to-end -end way but it's only this one task and that's something that probably doesn't scale up so the brain cannot afford to do that it cannot have an end-to-end -end network for every task so that's why these representations in the uh, in some areas of the cortex emerge so for example there is area that is known to represent the hand in space and uh, this is something that is that is useful and that gives the brain some modularity and some level of also universality so it's in a way kind of halfway between say the end-to-end -end models and the classical robot models here is the octopus which uh, is also a special interesting animal but uh, yeah i will not go uh, go into that uh yeah i think that uh, we're, i'm already behind schedule so i think we should skip this and this and uh, get close to the finish so there's a lot of bio-inspired body models but another is question is you know why would they make uh, good technology so looking at uh, this idea of self-calibration uh, or so body, body models so you know adaptive implicit, multimodal, distributed, all of these sort of would be expected for the brain. And the question is, if you are an engineer, you know, which of these uh, properties you would like to take on board? And adaptive, definitely yes. Uh, multimodal, probably yes. However, implicit or distributed, these things are really uh, alien to engineers, right? Because you, you don't want this kind of thing. It's really hard to handle. It's really hard to debug. And maybe we will one day have to really go there if we want really resilient robots. But so far, it's, it seems quite far from the engineering uh, practice. So in conclusion, uh, to model body representations, embodied computational models are needed. When we contrast human, animal, and robot body models, this helps us to understand mechanisms. And this automatic self-contained robot calibration is a major opportunity and also a major um, challenge. So with this, uh, yeah, I'd like to thank you for the attention. A little advert here, we still have a, a, a open postdoc position. And also, if you are interested in any kind of collaboration, you know, come and play with the ICAP or do a thesis or internship, uh, just uh, let me know. So thank you for the attention. Okay, thank you, Matej, uh, for, uh, for an excellent overview of your research trajectory. Uh, we do have time for questions, so I do believe there will be some. Uh, okay, feel free to ask anyone. Turn on the lights here. Yeah. OK, maybe uh, I will start with a question uh, before people decide. Uh, like you said, yeah, we do not really understand how proprioception is represented in the brain. You know, of course, we would need to endow robot with these proprioceptive representations. 
And in your earlier work that you did with Nadia Bednarova, you trained, you know, self-organizing map to create some uh, representative neurons for concrete uh, proprioceptive configurations for one hand or for the other hand, etc. So that's uh, using a self-organizing map uh, means that uh, we perform some kind of uh, clustering of all these proprioceptive configuration. And of course, we would probably need something like a representing a, uh, maybe a manifold or some lower dimensional representation of these proprioceptive configurations. The question is, if we use a self-organizing map, uh, we do some clustering process, which means that uh, we are in a sense losing some information about the accurate representation. So I'm wondering how is it done in the brain, whether these proprioceptive neurons in the map, I think it's 3A area, I guess, uh, whether they do communicate with some other modalities or whether that connectivity is done somehow in, in another way. Right. Uh, yeah, so uh, to, to my knowledge, so this 3A is a sort of, proprioceptive primary area, but of mm -hmm. course in, in the brain does, it doesn't mean that it's uh, it's isolated, it also communicates with the motor area and with the somatosensory area. I think there is even vestibular input and uh, so it's a mess, uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. We don't know exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is what I'm asking because what we are struggling now with is that if we want to, you know, connect these proprioceptive representations with touch information as another modality, then really if one wants to link the two modalities together, then it means that certain spatial configuration, special, sp certain proprioceptive configuration result in touch, but a slight difference in proprioceptive representation uh, results in no touch, you know? So we need to have very accurate mapping between the two modalities. And currently uh, the problem with this, you know, with, with SOMS, Maybe it could be somehow circumvented with some additional mechanisms, but relying on these winners in the SOM sort of results in that kind of problem that we are losing some kind of accuracy. And I'm, 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 I think that it has to be somehow solved and that should be solvable because definitely that's that's needed. Right. But then the question is whether we actually have that accuracy even in, in the adult brain. I mean, if you were asked to you know reach for a stimulus on your back or wherever. So first, I don't think you can imagine how you would do it. And even then, so so we have also videos from from the babies that when they let's say with the buzzer on the on the on the belly, they first reach somewhere else and then they yeah. do some kind of servo wing to come closer. So it may be that it, it just is not a map that it allows this kind of lookup. Maybe it just has to be so because we don't really need that. Maybe it just, you know, happens to be constructed on the way. And if you miss, then you just go closer because you can feel the discrepancy locally. Mm -hmm. So but we do have the map, right? We do have proprioceptive map in the brain, right? That's for sure. Yes. But I mean, the, the question, so, you know, so Kevin O'Regan would say that the fact that you have something lighting up in the homunculus doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't mean that you know where it is. You need to connect it to the rest to get any meaning. So, so mm -hmm. some, something lighting up in the map is maybe not really what matters. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a question. What, is, what that map is good for? Uh, because probably some additional mechanisms are important for connecting modalities. I'm quite confident with that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Are there other questions from from the audience? Okay, maybe stop sharing. Uh, I see one hand. Martin, go ahead. Martin, we cannot hear you. Okay, I, I'm talking away, but with a microphone <laughs> turned off. Yeah. So once again, so first of all, Matej, my my head off because this is really a, a, an impressive amount of work. This is this is high quality and also uh, high volume, I would say. <laughs> but that's not my question. That's just uh, the comment. So my question regards this: uh, how to sort of get this uh, self-touching off the ground? because you said that probably 
first it happens by chance. I don't know why babies would be motivated to touch themselves. Maybe that in the womb there is not enough space and their movement is restricted. But once they touch themselves for whatever reason, um, you said you are using uh, the learning progress uh, heuristics, which we, we know from ODR and others that it should work fine and it probably does. But have you tried something simpler? And that would be that uh, uh, this is a rewarding experience. Yes, when I touch myself, I have multi-sensory experience. So it can be sort of interesting for some reason. And maybe just the pure associative learning or correlational learning with adaptive uh, learning rate that would be much higher in case this is this is this moment so in case uh, i touch myself uh, i would increase the learning rate very much and this would be much better learned than you know waving my ha ha hands around and not touching myself so have you tried something like that because it sounds simpler maybe for the start maybe not as as good as learning progress but just an idea yeah i n n never actually thought uh, uh, yeah in this direction so yeah the, definitely so what what would be a i don't know a neural network or architecture that you would suggest does it need some neuromodulation or how would it well you know even if it, if it was pure associative learning even like something like habian learning but with the learning rate that is uh, adaptive that depends on 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 the reward or something like that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that would be definitely good as, as, a, as a, yeah to compare with okay that's a great idea thanks martin mm -hmm. maybe i would add to this uh, you were talking about this intrinsic motivation so that's one of the uh, yeah uh, quite successful research agendas in the community, as we know. And of course, it's highly relevant for, for this type of, you know, uh, knowledge acquisition, so to say, in, in, in the molten knowledge. And uh, there is a lot of different scenarios that have been applied in, in also different contexts. What can be that, you know, signal driving, driving the motor behavior? Uh, one could be, for instance, you know, uh, the curiosity resulting from inability to predict like, for instance, the inaccuracy of the forward model. So the baby might be inclined to reach for parts of the body where it doesn't know how it would feel, for instance, also on the proprioceptive side, also on the tactile side, how it would feel to be touched somewhere on the back part of the shoulder and uh, yeah, and various other signals. So um, I, I believe that this is a good way to go. I mean, I mean, you talked about this goal babbling. So it was reduced to like, uh, like first setting a, an artificial point on the skin and trying to reach it. The other would be just trying to, you know, uh, monitoring this learning progress and like monitoring the accuracy of the forward models for different parts of the space and just trying go in there like sampling from these uh, least least accurate or least examined parts of the body. So there's a vast space for exploration here in this direction. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're also doing um, motor babbling with monitoring the progress to compare with. So we're also doing that. There's a lot of these methods, these, you know, competence based and knowledge based. We're also working with Matthias Rolf, who has this particular way who worked with, you know, yeah. Jochen Steil, and this is like a continuous thing, it's path based. So the UDEA like so basically frameworks, they basically do like they go and then they go again. Whereas Matthias Rolf does it like in a continuous way that there is a path that he explores which has also some advantages that it it, it handles the, the, redundancy, the redundancy resolution because it always basically mm -hmm. finds one way, continuous way of reaching for a certain area. W mm -hmm. While the, the methods, we know if you use nearest neighbor, you can basically learn locally and then you can have also some kind of, you know, these continuities in the space. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of ways you can do it. So my current strategy is that we want to learn as much as we can from the baby data. So basically extract kinematics from videos and use that to constrain the models. Mm -hmm. Yeah, OK. Mm -hmm. And regarding that uh, calibration, so my understanding is that, uh, yeah, of course, we need uh, everybody, even humans, we need constant recalibration in order not to lose the accuracy. So and we actually are combining three modalities It's proprio, it's tactile and vision, right? So you said, for instance, that the vision kicks in quite late in, in early development. 
So can we say that these three modalities have an equally important role in a sense that, I mean, they can kind of bootstrap each other or can inform each other in, you know, in finding the, like, this optimization task solving? Or can we say that, for instance, that that vision dominates over touch, for instance? Because I read it somewhere that vision is a dominant modality that we trust more what we see rather than what we feel, maybe. Yes, yeah. So, 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 so there are studies also in babies, for example, Monica Gori or David Burr have done this kind of research, how how babies combine these modalities in a base optimal way. So, and it's true that vision somehow would have these sort of smaller variants and then it would be regarded as more uh, reliable. Uh, for, for, for our task, uh, yeah, that's why we, 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 we now do the buzzer experiments with these blind babies where we want to basically see the effect. It seems that in an adult brain with normal sighted people, you know, vision is really important. So the representations would be sort of really dominated somehow by it. Maybe that's why we sort of construct maybe the 3D representation of space somehow. And uh, whereas blind people, they have some kind of a warped representation of space, which is more motor based. And yeah, that's what we would like to understand. So yes, I, I hope to learn something from the from the data set with the visually mm -hmm. impaired kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, regarding now, you are the first one to have the uh, skin equipped skin equipped now, right? How accurate is the touch? Because it seemed like as if he had this protection over the forearms and the the chest, but it looked like very with a very coarse, like coarse grained accuracy of touch. What's the, the skin is the same like on the eye cup. It's this skin. It's the so... same. Yeah, but the thing is that there are no, there's no touch on, on fingers. So in the videos, we could see that forearm was touching the yeah. chest, yes. like a many to many contact, like. Yeah, it basically because we wanted to keep the hand. So we have this kind of additional cover on the wrist with the skin. So it has to basically touch like, let's say, with the back of the hand or with this big fat wrist. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was for technical reasons. Yeah, it's him. I see. Okay. Uh, are there more questions from anyone who is interested? If not, so I think we could uh, close this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, Maciej, thank you very much again that you agreed to uh, start a series of presentations. Big applause to you, really, as Martin said, and uh, good luck in your work. And thank you all guys who were with us online. Have a nice evening. Okay, it's my pleasure. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.